Welcome to Talking Comfort Live, a show that reminds us just how cool HVAC can be by discussing today's hot topics in home comfort. From learning to laughing and sharing personal experiences to challenging the leading industry narratives, our show goes deep inside the world of mini splits, heat pumps, and the inverter technology that brings efficient comfort to our products. And you can help us in our quest to make HVAC cool. We're looking for you to be a part of the show. If you have a question, please send it our way. We might take it live. Now grab a bucket and take a break. It's time for Talking Comfort Live. Welcome back. I'm James McIntyre, Senior Director of Commercial Sales with GREE. Thanks for joining us on our eighth episode of this year. Uh, why do we do this? To help you guide your customers to the right comfort solution and keep you at expert level of product knowledge. So this is for you. To get the most out of it, we invite you to be a part of it. So send us your questions or thoughts at any time using the question mark icon on your screen. <clears throat> uh, we try to get to all the questions and uh, talk in detail about those. But if we got anything left over, you know, we'll address them in a future episode. Today, we'll hear from Justin, who has a product day update for you. Um, and then we'll talk about how some people don't quite understand Gree's role in the industry, like just how big we are, that, that kind of thing. Then we've asked Vanessa to start the conversation comparing systems that use ductwork with systems that, re that feature refrigerant lines. After that, we'll continue the conversation and open the floor up to get some different perspectives from our panel, and we encourage you to send your thoughts as well. Then we'll sprinkle, sprinkle in uh, responses to a few of the comments left on our YouTube channel in hopes to clarify a few things. So again, this is your opportunity to connect with us and become more comfortable with the latest in Greek comfort. So let's start talking comfort. Justin, kick us off with a product update. So today I'm going to talk about our new R32 all match indoor units. And if you haven't heard me talk about all match before, the all match units refer to the indoor units that can be used in both the multi-zone or one-to-one -one application. But today I'm just gonna mostly focus on the one-to-one -one applications because that's where most of the changes uh, have occurred with the new R32 units. So with the old R410A all match units, in addition to the multi-zone applications, we could also take these units and pair them with a Vireo outdoor unit in a one-to-one -one application. And the units we had for that were the high wall, the floor ceiling, the cassette, and the slim duct. Now with the R32 units, we have quite more indoor unit options to choose from. And instead of just being matched with the Vireo, we're gonna have a much more wide array of options here. So in sizes 9K through 24K, we can have one-to-one -one matchups with the Vireo, our new Invo, and the Sapphire with high walls, slim ducts, cassettes, the floor ceiling console, and our new <clears throat> one-way cassette. And then in the 30 and 36K models, we can do a one-to-one -one with our Levo outdoor units. The reason for that obviously is the Levo line is the only one that goes up to a 30 and 36K. The other lines stop at 24. So now I'll talk about the new styles of units that we're gonna introduce. So here's kind of the whole lineup here. We've got the outdoor units, Sapphire, Invo, and Vario, and 9, 12, 18, and 24 for the all match. And then for the 30 and 36K, obviously we've got the Levo. Then for the indoor units, we have the new one-way cassette, which is available in 9, 12, 18, and a 20K model. Not quite a 24, but we have the 20K. Our new eight-way compact cassettes in 9K, all the way up through three tons, the high static pressure slim duct from 9K to 36K, the floor ceiling console, nine through 36, and the new floor standing model that's gonna be available in three tons only. So here's the new R32 eight-way cassettes, and there's gonna be three chassis sizes on these. So for the smaller chassis size, we're gonna have nine, 12, and 18. The 24K will be a standalone chassis, and then we'll have the 30 and 36K in the larger chassis. Uh, dimensions here in millimeters, uh, information's fresh, bringing it to you as soon as we can. Haven't had a chance to convert everything over, but we'll get all the sales brochure stuff updated and out to you as soon as we can. But it's important to note one thing we did with these new cassettes is we've changed the size so that they can fit in between the wood beams here 
generally the standard distance. You know, you have 22 on inch center beams. So we wanted to make sure that those units could fit. This is the new one way cassette. There's only one footprint for these, all four sizes. So I know these can be great applications if you're putting units out more towards walls, don't have a lot of ceiling space, things like that. Put these in and maybe you just want to direct air in, in one direction to have them going 360 or two way. So we're introducing these in, in the new all match. Here's the high static pressure series, pretty much the same series we've used in the past, except now we have that 30 and 36 K models available. And of course, these go up to 200 pascals or 0.8 inches of water gauge. So plenty of static pressure, provided you're not trying to <laughs> try to duck a whole home off of these. But generally, it's going to provide enough static pressure on the fan curve. And we've got the new R32 floor standing unit. These are very popular overseas. Generally, you see these in large conference rooms. They'll put these in a corner to kind of blow air, provide air throughout a large conference room. We've had requests for these in specialty markets here in the US. It's going to be a container only product. And like I said, it's going to be available in the 36K model only. More information to come on these. We're trying to get the full specs and all that. And as soon as we get all that, we'll make sure to get it out to you. And with everything else, AHRI, ratings, NEEP, literature, we should have all of that done and ready by the end of August. So AHRI should have all the ratings for all much posted by then. We'll have all the NEEP ratings for cold climates, hopefully posted um, by the end of August. And we should have all of our new sales brochures, submittals, and manuals for these models up and available on the website as well. So if you have any questions about these products or any other products that we provide, please click the question mark icon on your screen, submit your question, and we'll do our best during the show to try to answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Justin. So what we'd like to do now is take a look at our misnomer. Uh, let's take a look. And we've got uh, a reading that says GRI is just a large mini split manufacturer. Um, and uh, in the meantime, while we answer this and go over this, please feel free to ask any questions that you have or leave any comments that you'd like to leave. But let's go with that one more time. That is GRI is just a large mini split manufacturer. So who would like to take a whack at that one first? Uh, well, like I told you, in recent years, GRI is becoming more and more widely known in the United States. Uh, before that, they kind of focus on manufacturing um, mini split products and VRF for some other manufacturers. I know they've kind of moved away from that uh, to focus on their own brand. Um, for you know, for the U.S., everybody will probably be more familiar with the ductless mini splits, uh, our central heating and cooling units like the Flex, and uh, you know our Multi Pro and large three phase of your systems, but green manufactures far more products than that. Uh, we just really haven't seen them uh, here in the U S but globally, you're going to find things like, uh, package units, you know, three phase package units, large chillers, air to water, heat pumps, water heaters. They have a whole range of, uh, home appliances, you know, washers and dryers, <laughs> uh, electric ranges, refrigerators. Uh, and then in addition to just the finished goods that they manufacture, they also have their own, uh, you know, vertically integrated companies like Landa Compressor. They make compressors that can be used in uh, other products for other manufacturers. They have the Kaibang Motor Company, which manufactures their own uh, variable speed motors that can be used in other products. They manufacture uh, uh, like polymer parts, plastic parts through their molding division for not just air conditioners, but you know, cars, you know, they've manufactured stuff for, for Mercedes cars, but in, in the past. So, uh, GRI is much more than just a standard, uh, you know, small time ductless manufacturer. They are a massive manufacturing conglomerate. Um, so there's just, they're just one of those biggest companies, you know, you may not have heard of. Right. Yeah. In addition, you know, they, uh, they manufacture their own wire. Uh, their, yeah. their misters, uh, you name it. I mean, a lot of this, a lot of these components, of course, no manufacturer manufactures everything. Um, and there is some similarities, you know, between that market and the U S market, as far as that goes, there's all kinds of joint ventures and all kinds of things that have worked out in, you know, from a global standpoint. Um, I mean, they've had a joint venture for, I don't know, over 30 years, uh, with uh, company D, you know, the, the <laughs> Daikin actually, uh, to manufacture some compressors and, you know, so it's like, you'll find Greek compressors and 
many different brands, uh, especially globally. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's just an enormous company. I mean, and one more time, you know, one in three air conditioners in the world is is made is manufactured by Gree. You know, whether you know it or not. <laughs> but I, you know, you guys are regular attendees, so you guys see this all the time. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Greg, would you like to add anything to that? No, I think you guys pretty well covered it. I mean, they do make a lot of product, and you know, as Justin was talking about, you know, um, here for us, you know, it's just a matter of what products we're selling, which I think we've got a pretty good selection our, ourselves is what we're offering, you know? So, yeah, they're, they're, they've been doing this for a while. Yeah, yeah, quite some time, right? Um all right, guys. Well, I appreciate that. So we're gonna we're gonna hear from Vanessa Steckler now, and uh, in her versus series. Back to our versus series, where we break down the pros and cons of different HVAC techniques and technology. I'm Vanessa Steckler, and today we're comparing traditional ductwork to refrigerant lines when delivering comfort throughout a living or working space. You may be surprised which method brings the higher return on installation. Let's get right to it. In one corner, we have traditional ductwork, large, rigid, and something you've probably seen in a basement or two over the years. And in the other corner, refrigerant lines, small, flexible, and efficient. Let's look at six key areas they differ. First, space requirements. Refrigerant lines are significantly smaller and more flexible, making them ideal for homes with limited space or complex designs. They can easily be routed through tight spaces and around obstacles. On the flip side, ductwork requires larger, more rigid pathways. It often needs to be installed in attics, basements, or custom-built solutions, which can use up valuable space within the home. How about installation complexity? Refrigerant lines typically require fewer labor hours to install. The process is simpler and quicker, involving small diameter copper tubes. Ductwork installation, however, is more labor-intensive and time-consuming. It involves cutting, fitting, sealing, and insulating large sections of ductwork. And another important difference, system efficiency. Since refrigerant lines carry refrigerant rather than air, there's no concern about air leakage, leading to more efficient operation. Ductwork must be properly sealed to prevent air loss, which can result in up to 30% of conditioned air being lost, increasing energy consumption and reducing comfort. Now, something not often considered, insulation. Refrigerant lines typically require less insulation. Some insulation is needed to prevent condensation and maintain efficiency, but it's generally easier to insulate small diameter lines. Ductwork, on the other hand, requires substantial insulation, especially in unconditioned spaces like attics and crawl spaces. You've probably been thinking to yourself, when is she going to bring up zoning? Well, refrigerant lines allow for more flexible system designs, such as ductless mini split systems, which can provide zoned heating and cooling. Think about it, having a unit right there in a given space, distributing the exact temperature you've dialed up is one of the greatest benefits of running refrigerant lines. While zoning is possible with ductwork, it's more complex and costly to implement, typically requiring additional dampers, controls, and extensive modifications. How about the look and impact of these two methods? Refrigerant lines can be concealed more easily within walls, ceilings, or floors, leading to a cleaner and less intrusive installation. Small indoor units can be mounted high on walls, on the ceiling, or even recessed, making them less obtrusive than large registers and vents. Ductwork is large and more visible, often requiring bulkheads or soffits to hide, which can impact the home's aesthetics. So there you have it. While both refrigerant lines and traditional ductwork have their place in HVAC, refrigerant lines offer significant advantages in space efficiency, installation complexity, air loss prevention, insulation requirements, and flexibility. For modern HVAC installations, especially in homes where space, comfort, and efficiency are key considerations, refrigerant lines are a clear winner. Thanks for joining us on Versus. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more HVAC tips and insights. If you're interested in Grease offerings of mini splits and multi-zone products, visit GreeComfort.com. Stay comfortable out there. At Gree, we're by your side. Thanks, Vanessa. Now let's open up to the group because we had another reading on the misnomer that we need to discuss. Installing ductwork is easier than installing refrigerant, pri uh, refrigerant piping. Um, 
just remember that the, uh, the question mark icon to the right of your screen will enable you to uh, ask any questions or leave any comments, or if you need clarification, uh, please go ahead and do that. Uh, but again, on the misnomer, it says installing ductwork is easier than installing refrigerant piping. So I'd like to go first on that. Um, having done both, um, it absolutely depends on the situation. Um, but uh, we also have ducted equipment as well as multi-zone piping systems. So, you know, it can absolutely just, just depend on the application. You know, if you're... Um, you got a job where you're trying to find a chase to get to the second story, for example, you know, having some 30 by 30 box, that kind of thing, you know, people are losing square footage for their house now, you know, and you might use a ductless unit instead. And it may be a lot easier to run a quarter and three eighths line set, for example, than it would be to install, you know, something that large, or let's be honest and run of 16 inch flex duct up to the attic, <laughs> which, you know, might be what, the, what option that you choose. So it could definitely depend. Uh, Greg, what do you think? Well, I think there's a lot of things to consider there. Um, I think, in my opinion, running refrigerant lines would be easier because it takes up less space and you can get it in tighter quarters and you can make, you know, with with the equipment that we offer, we got some pretty long line lengths we can reach as well. So you're not having to use larger ductwork. And in a ductwork situation, you have to use larger ductwork and maybe graduate it down to smaller ductwork where with what we got, you're just doing one long refrigerant run and that's going to be a lot easier than installing ductwork right so you know and, and typically and this is actually going into a, one of the questions that that come up but you know typically you don't unless you're making joints in those refrigerant lines to make that long run but you can buy pretty long runs of pipe without having to make joints rarely are your leaks in the piping itself so once that pipe's in place, you're done with it. Right. So, it, you know, and you don't have, when you're talking about efficiencies to equipment, there's a lot of loss of efficiency through ducting that is not considered compared to using mini split type products, you know, where you're using a wall mount where you have no duct work, the efficiency level off of that is extreme compared to having a ducted system. Now, we also have ducted units as well, but if you minimize the duct work, so if you were using more slim ducts and with minimal duct work to it, your loss through that is going to be less than having one large duct system. So right. There's a lot of benefits to zone, basically zoning by refrigerant and minimizing losses through ductwork, whether you're still using duct ducted product or you're using non-ducted product, you're still increasing efficiency. Right, well, I mean, I think it's a good point, you know, uh, figuring in the duct loss like that. And I, I think Justin's made this point in the past, like the difference between SEER and SEER 2 and the, uh, like the M1 blower testing that, you know, changing the way that they would, you know, like the AHRI push for something more realistic, I believe they went up to uh, 0.5 inches of static right if that if i'm not mistaken yeah well, uh, so 0.1 to 0.5 well yeah so it went from 0.1 to 1.5 how many duct systems were at 0.1 just the ones in the hri labs um you know how many of them are at 0.5 a whole hell of a lot of them and so that actually gave us you know if you if you look at the way the efficiencies were before versus the way the efficiencies were the adjustments that the manufacturers had to do to their equipment to hit the new minimum efficiencies a big chunk of that was just changing you know, having to change the efficiency rating of that piece of equipment because of duct loss. Right. Yep. Yep. Um, so yeah, if you can eliminate the ducting or you can shorten the ducting or, you know, lessen the amount of ducting that you've got, the more efficiency that you're going to see, the more energy savings the customer is going to see. Cause I mean, we all know if I took a very nice, you know, 18 CR2 piece of equipment and I do some bad duct work on that piece of equipment, is the customer going to be saving a lot of money? No, Not as much as they could. You know, right. <laughs> definitely not as much as they could. So, I mean, it, it can be that you can use a, uh, you know, bottom line style piece of equipment with a good duct system and get the same kind of power bill as you would have at a high efficiency system with bad duct work. Um, I mean, we know that that has been the lifeblood for equipment. Um, but that's also why the insulation classes to duct work that's used in unconditioned spaces went way up too. Mm-hmm because of the loss through the ductwork and through the insulation and stuff like that. Not take away from the fact that we have to insulate refrigerant lines, 
but our refrigerant line, our thickness on the refrigerant lines, that class has went up too. So we don't get any loss through those refrigerant lines with that thick insulation on there. Right. But your loss through the refrigerant pipe is going to be minif- minimal compared to what your loss through ductwork is. And then when now that you're having to run ductwork with larger insulation on it, now you've just compacted the problem of getting the ductwork to fit in, into tighter spaces and stuff like that. Right. Well, and there's also the additional testing and all the rest of the stuff that's been done, you know, in some areas, lower door testing, all of that stuff, you know, contributes to cost and time and effort and all the rest of that. Um, I mean, in this case, if I've got a wall mount unit, it's rated at 12,000 BTUs. Am I getting 12,000 BTUs? Yeah, there's no reason why I shouldn't. If I've got a ducted system that's 12,000 BTUs or 36 or whatever it is, am I actually getting that capacity in that case? You know, maybe maybe we're not always doing the math to determine whether or not you're actually getting the rated heat, you know, heating or cooling capacity out of the system that you've put in. You know, a lot of folks, not you guys, of course, you guys, you know, are always getting training and stuff like that. But, you know, the people that aren't listening to this right now, you know, they might just be looking for a delta and calling it good. You know, right. well, a delta at, you know, 1200 CFM versus a delta at 1050 is not the same level of capacity. Right. I mean, seems like that's just a basic capacity calculation. Um, and what we're going to do now, and, and thank you both of uh, uh, both Greg Brunts and Justin Silsbury. I uh, <laughs> appreciate that. Uh, now we're going to take a look at these questions. We've got a lot of really great questions, and we are going to try our best to get to every single one of them. Uh, I'm going to start off with a question for Mr. Silsbury. Uh, on the um, all match units, you talked about a one way ceiling cassette. And the question we've got is uh, Will this unit fit between ceiling joists? And uh, whether or not the, uh, the components can be accessed from the bottom of the unit, like if you need access, like in the attic, for example. So, on the um, <clears throat> sizing of the unit, it's going to be you know, 39 inches long, approximately about 15 inches wide. Uh, so if you're doing like 24 inch center construction, uh, there should be any problem for that unit to fit up in between the the ceiling joists. So I know that was kind of taking consideration to make sure that's going to fit uh, up between those ceiling joists and not have any issues uh, running into anything. Also, on like the height of the unit, they're only seven inches um, tall or the depth be seven inches tall. So you don't need a lot of interstitial space, um, you know, up above the ceiling or between floors uh, to get that unit up up in there right um now this is going to be similar to um the gmv style uh one-way cassette and I'm, i haven't seen the parts breakdown of that so i'm trying to remember i think on the one-way cassette you'd access it from the side is that correct now on that one, uh, the board is uh, is accessed from the bottom. Uh, all components technically can be accessed from the bottom. The one thing that you can't access is going to be your flare connections or your drain connection. So you know that's that's something to keep in mind on that. Um, uh, you know, in the past on the one way cassettes for VRF projects, I've been asked by engineers, you know, our favorite people. Uh, I've been asked, uh, and they are. But, uh, you know, I've been asked, like, what, what what's the absolute minimum that we possibly need? Well, you know, coming from a technical background that I am and having to actually work on pieces of equipment, I don't want everything put in at an absolute minimum. You know, uh, that can absolutely depend on the job and what kind of access that you have. But in a typical attic installation, for example, you know, you may be able to get to those flare connections if you needed to get to those in the future, just like you could, you know, the drain line for, you know, regular preventive maintenance. Um, but everything else, like accessing the pump, the board, your um well in, in vrf's case the electronic expansion valve or um or your sensors or whatever you know you can clean the coil and all that you can do that all from the bottom so you know you do have access from the bottom there's also a, a you know this um the grill is uh, quite a bit wider than the unit itself uh so you may see depending on the construction you may <laughs> see that you might be able to access some of those out those external um connections via the bottom as well so it all depends but on the uh, on the construction side of it, you know, if somebody says, uh, you know, can it fit between like 16 inch on center? You know, depends on you know how much leeway they've given you there, uh, but it is definitely something to plan for. And uh, last but not least, one thing I'll say about the one way cassette is uh, you you maybe want to put it above a window. Well, when you start trying to find your joists, you know, uh, you you might find that they're running towards the window. 
you know, and that that's not really how you you want you don't want to stick the one way in sideways, right? <laughs> so, but if you're if you're working new construction or if they're open to uh, to you know uh, uh, boxing that out, I can't remember what the term is, but you know if they're open to doing that, then you can use a one way cassette pretty easily. Uh, yeah, but the so, same thing can apply to four ways, you know, other pieces of equipment. Yeah. But if you were um, mounting in like a hard ceiling versus a drop ceiling uh, with no kind of attic access, then you need to put a, a service panel there just to get to the flare connections and things like that, just in case there was a, right. a leak. Yeah. 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 That's the, I think that's the, it, it's kind of odd. You know, the people that have to work on stuff hate when people bury stuff inside the wall. Uh, but then the people that install it seem to like to do that pretty often. You know, I, you know, <laughs> I don't know why there's always this disconnect between the two groups of people, but, uh, uh, you know, I don't know how many times we got, well, you know, we ran this line set, whatever it is, and it's all buried already. It's like, you're, you're just now doing the startup and it, you know, <laughs> it's just, um, anyway, so let's go look at another question. Unless uh, Greg would like to add something in that uh, discussion. No, I think you guys handled that one well. All right. Next question I have is, is Gree going to be putting room temperature on thermostat controls, um, especially wired controllers? Most customers I've put Gree systems in are not pleased with not knowing the actual temperature of the room by the thermostat. So who would like to go first on that? Well, I'll, I'll start with it. So on the... On the multi-pro controls, uh, the XC7C and XC70, you already have that option. In the parameter settings, you can set it to display room temperature. As far as the mini split controls go, I'm going to refer to Justin on that one. Yeah, on um, the mini split controls, um, we're looking at adding some additional features there as we kind of build out our controls uh, side of things. Right now, it's just going to show you your set temp. Um, on the newest Flex Smart Control, we're looking at adding a feature to show both room temp and uh, outdoor temperature as well. So it's going to give you some more options, kind of see some additional data. Um, as of right now, the, the ducts controls are just going to show you your, your set temp. Right. There is, there is one way, all right? Um, you can using the handheld wireless remote. Um, I have one because I have a unit in my. This is a fake unit, but you know behind me. But there's another one, you know, <laughs> uh, back there. But uh, using this remote, uh, there is a. Um, or uh, depending on which remote you have, there will be like a house button, or you know you can press a button and there's a, there's a house symbol that comes up. Uh, on this remote, it is the temp button, and if you press the temp button. Uh, until it shows the thermometer, it's moving the thermometer back and forth. And if it shows the thermometer inside the house, it will show you what temperature is being like what temperature is being sensed. Okay. And if you leave that activated on the wireless remote, every time you press a button, it'll show what temperature is being sensed, the set point, and then the display goes back off, or it just stays back on, you know, on the set point, depending on if you have the light button enabled. Uh, what that means is it'll also show the same thing on the wired controllers as well. Uh, you have a uh, temp button or house button or whatever on many of the wired controllers. I can't speak to all of them on the mini split line, uh, but if you cycle through that, it'll at least show it at least temporarily. Uh, but honestly, uh, and you know, I'm I'm as red I'm as I bleed red, white, and blue as much as anybody else, or red and white from our Canadian friends. Um, <laughs> But um, the way a lot of these have been done in the past, at least globally, is that, you know, if somebody's cold, they turn it up. If they're hot, they turn it down. You know, they're, they're basically going, this is, the, this is the temperature that I'm trying to get, you know. Uh, I know that doesn't work for every customer, but as far as an explanation, sometimes it can help. Like their air conditioner in their car, for example, typically doesn't show what the temperature is inside the car. You know, they, they set the temperature and they're like, oh, I'm kind of hot now. Okay, so they turn it down some. You know what I mean? It all depends on how you want to use it, but... Uh, but, you know, knowing that we're, we're constantly adding features to further North Americanize this equipment, I mean, you should take at least some solace in that, knowing that we're really trying our best to, to help, uh, you know, our, our fellow North Americans. Well, I guess one last thing to throw in there, too, is on the single zone mini splits, you can use the 24-volt adapter, and then you can connect any, any uh, thermostat you want to use. Right, right. 
which can be Wi-Fi, can give you room temp, give you your temperature setting, whatever you, whatever you want. But uh, you do have to apply power to that 24 volt adapter. You are going to have to run thermostat wires from that 24 volt adapter. You're probably going to want to hide it somewhere so that it's not, you know, hanging next to the unit because that's not going to look very good. So, you know, that would be something you want to definitely plan for before you install the equipment, knowing you're going to be doing that so you can hide the wiring and stuff like that, the controls. Right. Okay. Uh, we're going to go with two related questions and they both come from the same person. So uh, on the multi 24 is the three eighths to half reducer required, or can I use my own copper press fitting reducer? And also why is it on the 12, you have half instead of three H suction. So that all depends as far as the line sizes go. It depends on the indoor unit. Refrigerant lines are always sized to the indoor unit. Your outdoor unit connections are always quarter three eighths on the multi-zone equipment. Right. Any adaption done needs to be done at the outdoor unit. If they want to use a press fitting that's going to adapt them from say half inch to a three eighths connection on that outdoor unit, I don't. I mean, all you are giving you is a flare adapter. So if you're not going to be, if you're using press fittings, I don't see any reason why you couldn't use that. It, the only thing is, is we got to be able to adapt the refrigerant pipe size, say from half to three eighths, so you can make the connection. So no, there's no requirement that says you have to use Breeze flare adapter. But the requirement is you do have to size the refrigerant lines to the indoor unit. And that changes depending on what indoor unit. If you're using a Levo unit versus a Vireo unit versus a Sapphire unit, it's all about the indoor unit and the refrigerant flow that's got to happen through that indoor unit. And if you use the line set size that's too small, you probably won't have a problem with cooling but I assure you, you will have a problem with heating up because your discharge line, because now your indoor coil is your condenser, your discharge line is going to be too small. And you're absolutely going to have problems with that machine. Right. Uh, I'd like to add to that. Uh, one is, uh, you know, the question uh, was also, why are we going from three eighths to half inch for a one ton unit? And, uh, you know, it, it absolutely is, is to do with testing of the equipment itself. And um, I don't know what the exact number is, but there's going to be a maximum amount of capacity that we that we have tested and gotten through a 3 eighths, and it is less than 12,000 BTUs. So they, they increase that to a half inch in order to account for that additional refrigerant volume coming back. Uh, the reason why the liquid line doesn't change is because liquid is so much more dense than gas. Uh, and finally, there's also a question of refrigerant velocity. Like we must maintain enough refrigerant velocity to feed oil back, you know, because as just as a result of running a compressor, you're going to have some oil leave, and we got to be able to get that oil back and ensure that we can get it back. Um, you know, the, I mean, the fact is, through the testing on those, like the, for example, on max maximum length line sets, you know, this is what we got to have in order to get 12,000 BTUs. I mean, we see it on the uh, multi pro VRF side quite a bit you know we've got a lot of in between sizes so for instance on the quarter and a half you can get 14 15,000 BTUs out of that uh, but at 18,000 BTUs we got to go to 3 eighths and 5 eighths you know it's just a question of volume and uh, velocity yep yeah yeah you um, hit the nail on the head it's all about volume and velocity to maintain capacity um so I'd also like to talk a little bit more about the other part of the question about using like aftermarket fittings you know that kind of thing um you know, as long as these fittings are, are, you know, tested for the refrigerant pressures that you would expect out of R410A or later, R32, for example, um, you know, as long as they're, you know, full flow, that kind of thing, you're not going to cause some kind of restriction. You're not inserting a piece of copper inside of it or whatever. You know, you got some full flow. Uh, you know, we're, we're not recommended brands, but there's nothing to prevent you from using that. And um, it's, it's no different than any other piece of equipment that you might have to make some change, like, might have to uh, adjust things too, basically. Uh, you know, if you if you got to clamp something down in order to get it, and there, you know, our literature says that it's got to be a, a certain size, because uh, we see that on the multi-pro and VRF side, you know, from time to time as well, right? 
that you have to that you need to run a, a five eighths line set and then but it needs to be a half inch connection well you know how do you step that down how are you going to you know uh, uh you know address that problem right and what you do you know you you step that down from five eighths to half inch as close as you can to the indoor unit you know and send it as you guys like to say on the uh <laughs> on social media <laughs> um i like that term yeah just send it you know i mean <laughs> um, well i'd say if you're using third-party um connectors or whatever just make sure that it passes your pressure test and it holds vacuum right right no leaks. you know there's something to be said about that because i actually had a call a couple of years ago on a couple different fittings they were using that were using like an overing type gasket up inside it and and again i'm not trying to talk brands or cutting me down or anything like that but the point is what you just said makes perfect sense because that's exactly what was happening it would hold pressure it would not hold vacuum so testing it for both that it you know pressurize it doesn't leak and vacuum we're holding our vacuum that's going to assure you that the fittings leak free Right. All right. Uh, let's take some time for a, a couple more questions, and then we're going to roll on through and then answer some more questions on our way back. Uh, just as a reminder, the question mark icon at the bottom right hand uh, part of the screen is how you how you let your voice be heard. All right. We've got a question about the I feel function. I feel on the remote. If you don't know uh, about that, there is a button on that remote that will let the indoor unit uh, effectively sense the temperature of the remote itself. So if you're holding the remote, it gives you a more accurate representation of the temperature that you are experiencing. Um, so the question is, does it have to be pointed at the unit in order for it to work? All right, so a quick explanation that I can give you on iFeel is that once you press that button, it basically applies a correction factor. So if you have, if it is 75 degrees at the remote itself, it's being sensed at the remote. If it, if it thinks it's 75 degrees, you hit iFeel, it will let the indoor unit know as long as you hear a beep, right? It lets the indoor unit know that you're looking at 75. If it was detecting 72, for example, it applies a three degree um, uh, correction to that temperature. And it does that for 15 minutes. So you might see it ramp up, ramp down, whatever it is that you're looking for it to get uh, for 15 minutes. And every 15 minutes, while I feel is enabled, that light sensor that our uh, our transmitter on the front of that remote uh, will flash every 15 minutes from then on. If the unit picks up that signal, it will continue to use I feel. If it doesn't, it returns back to normal operation. One thing I must add is every time you press a button on that remote, it also sends that signal. So within that 15 minute time frame, even if the remote's not pointed at the unit and they update it, it's still using I feel. If you have it disabled, I feel it will constantly and forever use I feel. And as long as it gets a signal from that remote, it will continue to operate. I mean, I hope that was clear. Uh <laughs> well, another good test that that was shared to me by Daniel, which is not with us on here with us today, but I liked his thought process. So let's say you're keeping it in a cradle close to the indoor unit. That's fine. But wherever you're keeping it, what you want to do is put it in I feel, set it in the cradle, and then you want to just raise the temperature up and down and make sure the head's beeping. Right. If the head ain't beeping, it ain't read it ain't gonna keep reading it for I feel. Right. But if it's in the cradle and you raise the temperature up and down and it does beep, you know it's communicating with it, so it's in the line of sight of it to stick, keep I feel functioning. Right. Um, I, in fact, use it the same way. I, I keep the remote sitting on my uh, end table and, uh, you know, do everything I can to prevent the kids from getting it. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, if you set it somewhere and you press a button and it beeps, you know you, you've got all the confidence in the world that I feel the next 15 minutes when it sends another signal, it will pick that up. Uh, sometimes we get a question, is there, is there anything on the indoor unit that's going to indicate that? You know, like, would it beep? Okay, well, so the question I would have for you is, do you want your unit beeping every 15 minutes? No, no, there's not. So uh, so what, what you, so if, as long as it's able to pick up that signal and you, and you keep that remote, you know, stationary, uh, it will constantly use iFill from then on. But one word of caution I will say on that is, 
you do also need to ask yourself why it is like you might have to constantly use i feel right so if you've got an application where that you know obviously not something that you guys put in but somebody else you know one of the competitions put you know put this unit in um you know and it's not reading the right temperature why is it not reading the right temperature right that's a you know do we have a hole in the back of the unit that wasn't sealed up is that unit mounted three feet off the floor is it you know do we have a you know a, a hutch or a china cabinet or something like that sitting below it blocking <laughs> airflow you know that kind of thing i mean those things happen uh, people like to move their furniture around and they can't move their air conditioner so they do things to try to hide it you know stuff like that you know is it going to work correctly at that point as far as it knows it is as far as it knows it thinks it's doing an amazing job you know, hey, I meet set point in 15 seconds, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So if you're trying to use I feel or even a wired controller to to try to solve that problem, it's not really solving that problem. You know, it can get you by for a while, but it's, you know, it may not work like that in heat, for example, you know. And if you pull that outer cover off that wall mount and the wasp flies out and stings you in the head, <laughs> probably because the hole around the line set wasn't sealed very well. Yeah, that's an actual story. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a real world story um i was uh i was familiar with that same story yeah if you've got bugs building nests inside your walmart air conditioner it's a pretty clear indication that it wasn't sealed up properly behind it you know and you were also getting air there affecting that sensor which was causing it to not sense the temperature in the room properly right right and if you don't oh. want to seal it up i guess you could try to sell it as like a poor man's fresh air intake or something um you know <laughs> That's All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who needs an Envo? We can just not install it correctly, right? Sure. Uh, <laughs> okay. Wow, there, there are so many questions. Here, I got another one. Um, on a ceiling cassette, does the condensation pump run at all times, or does it cut off and on as needed? It's got to float in there. It cuts on and off. I don't believe they run all the time. All right. So in cooling mode, um, I can definitely tell you on the multi-pro cassettes and VRF cassettes that in cooling mode, if it's in cooling mode, the condensate pump does run all the time. The The float switch is used as an indication that you've got too high of a water level. It's not a two-position style float switch. Um, in heat mode, it is. Like, you know, the, if the float switch trips in heat mode for some, right, for some reason, you know, it'll bring that condensate pump on. Uh, but in cooling mode, it does it does run all the time. Well, I stand corrected. I didn't know. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, this is this is why we do what we do here, right? Uh, yeah, it runs all the time. It's an impeller type. Uh, it's not like a piston type. It's not you know you're not worried about it running dry that kind of thing like you would out of a piston type or a uh, uh, a non uh, self priming pump like you may see in some uh, external mi mounted mini split pumps. It's just an impeller. Uh, it doesn't rely on the water, the compression of the water, or whatever. Uh, to help it, you know, cool or whatever. Um, we see some very, very long life out of this style of pump, which is why we continue to use it to this day. Uh, I've honestly, I can count on one hand how many times I've seen one of these pumps actually fail. Nine times out of 10, somebody's wanting to replace it because it's got a bunch of junk in it. Um, and you may not know this, but you can actually, you can disassemble the pump. You can take the bottom cap off the bottom and clean it up real nice and put it right back on again and to keep on running. They, uh, they actually work really well. So I hope that answered that question. Uh, next one, let's see. Uh, I'm not doing that one. that one. Let's see here. What are some good applications for the high static slim duct unit? Okay. Um, well, I can tell you that we've seen this application. We've seen that unit used in residential and light commercial applications. Uh, I mean, I've seen it used in uh, everything from uh, in, in a dog food manufacturing plant to, uh, to, a, um, to someone's uh, main bedroom, for example. So they're used in many different applications, uh, pretty much anywhere that you might use a um, multi-position air handler. I mean, if you take a look from a, uh, like a price, point, uh, price point standpoint, uh, you may see that the uh, horizontal ducted units or the pancake style, whatever you want to call them, um, you know, they can be a bit less expensive than than full on air handling units. Um, we see those used a lot, you know, in zoning applications where they want to do uh, bedrooms versus living areas without having something on the wall. 
you know, that kind of thing. Um, but that, yeah. that was really what I was referring to, too, as far as zoning goes and minimizing your ductwork. You could use ducted units like that and have, you know, a couple different ones, whatever, however you're trying to zone it out, and you're going to have minimal ductwork on it. You I think basically just got to have a small return coming up to it and then a small supply coming up. And before Depending we, on the size, right? Yeah. So, you know, before we've talked about, um, you know, trying to have multiple zones versus single zones, things like that. And a lot of times there are many rooms in the home that uh, the BTU load is just too small for an individual unit. And so those slim duct units are perfect for tying multiple rooms together that have, that, you know, on their own, each have a very small BTU load. Well, you can use a slim duct to uh to zone those out and i think they're they're probably easier to install and take up a lot less space than a vertical air handler would so i think that's a perfect application for them i right. agree i agree with you 100%. Um, well you know high crawl spaces and basements and stuff if you're trying to maintain like if you've got a tall guy like me you know that's the homeowner or something you know maybe you want to maintain some overhead space well putting in a horizontal application large you know big square style unit you know is going to take up a heck of a lot more headspace you know we, so we've seen that installed in those applications too where they've got you know um shorter but wider ductwork connected to it because these are shorter and wider units um and you you know you're maintaining some headspace or above a drop ceiling you know those style uh, of applications that's why they're that's why they're manufactured actually is is to go in those tight spaces just like that so so a lot of places to use them um don't shy away from using them because they, they're really really good units really are um very low amp draw you know what i mean you name it okay so um let's see here um on the r32 single zone all match systems which outdoor unit is predominantly being used to connect and match against which one has the ahri rated document so as of right now the all match units are going to be rated in a one-to-one -one configuration with the vireo and of course, you know, you have the duct uh, multi-zone uh, ratings, whether it's ducted, mixed, or uh, ductless, right? They rate them differently that way. With the upcoming R32 units, the whole point of kind of expanding uh, that lineup is so that on the 9K through 24K, we're going to have different ratings than the one-to-one -one for Vireo, Invo, and Sapphire, right? Because what's the point of, of making them all compatible if we're not giving you a rating, right? Because obviously, if you put a slim duct on a Sapphire versus a Vario, the Sapphire is going to get a better rating, right? So we want to put that out there because, uh, you know, there may be opportunities for additional rebates and things like that. Uh, and then, of course, on the Levo, you're going to have the ratings with the 30 and 36K models. So, um, yeah, on those, like I said, the 9 through 24, should be the Vireo Invo and Sapphire, 1336. You're going to see the Levo. Okay. And are those, uh, are the new model numbers for the R32 units published? Uh, so we've created all the model numbers. We've gotten most of the literature up on the one to ones. All the all match stuff should be up hopefully by the end of the month, along with the Flex. Um, now, if you look at, say, AHRI database, you're going to see the new R32 model numbers for most of these as well for the one-to-ones. So you're going to see the, the new Levo, Vireo, Invo, Sapphire, uh, the new Flex ratings are up as well. So um, they're created, they're published in, in multiple locations. It's just as of right now, we're waiting on, for example, the Flex. We're waiting on like the uh, fan curves, ex extended ratings, things like that to finish building out the literature and the web pages um so that's why it's it's just taking a little longer to get everything up uh versus you know, the original timeline we had right and when you're saying you know uploaded you're you're referring to the greetcomfort.com website is that right absolutely it's the best place <laughs> to find all the, the latest and greatest information <laughs> that once again that's greetcomfort.com okay so we've got uh, a, a couple a few more uh relatively quick questions um uh, but we also have an eight part flex question that we will absolutely get to. So if you want to hear that and talk about flex in detail, 
please wait till the end because that's when we're going to get into the nitty gritty of that technical question that we've been asked. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and what does the temperature setting do when it is in dry mode? I can go ahead and answer that. That is going to be what it uses to determine what temperature it should be running at. Okay, just like cooling mode, but it does cooling mode, but at a very slow, very low capacity style cooling mode. So it's doing everything it can not to exceed the set point that you provided. So if you drop the set point down to 68 degrees, your space might get down to 68 degrees. Depends on what your load is, depending on, you know, the amount of capacity that that unit was originally designed to do. Uh, but if you want to, um, you know, just make it a little bit drier in the space, not necessarily a whole lot of cold, you know, much colder, uh, use the dry mode. It makes the fan speed run slower, therefore making the cold temperature, keeping the cold temperature cold, therefore also making the compressor run at a lower, you know, uh, lower capacity, lower hertz, lower amp draw, you know, saving energy, that kind of thing. Uh, we see dry mode used a lot, you know, in the uh, spring and fall, depending on where you live, because uh, you might have cool but wet days. It is a good option for that. So, again, the uh, it is literally the set point for the temperature of that space, but it's just in dry mode. Okay. Uh, all right. So we're going to get back to the eight-part question. And then we are, let's see, if you want to add Wi-Fi capability to the floor ceiling multi-zone unit or single zone, I guess the floor ceiling one um, <laughs> is the only option to connect a controller, which has Wi is the only option to connect a controller, which has Wi-Fi capability like the XE 72, or can you solely add an adapter to connect into the indoor unit main control board to obtain Wi-Fi capability? Okay. So can you get Wi-Fi by doing a module or do you have to use an XE 72? So on the floor ceiling console, you can use the Wi-Fi enabled uh, a wall control to get the Wi-Fi. Um, yeah, there's no we module have, option. It's there is only, a module option. I'm trying to remember which one it is. Um, but on the floor ceiling, it doesn't work, is what I under, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And, I think on the floor ceiling, it has to be the wired control. Okay. Yeah, we typically don't use the models anymore because most of the units already come with the Wi-Fi. Right, <laughs> but that, one, in the board, that, one, that one doesn't. That one doesn't come with the module. Yeah. And the only way, you can't add a module to it. You have to use the wired controller. Yeah. Okay, so you have to use the wired controller like the XE72. Yes. Uh, or 24-volt uh, adapter? Or 24-volt adapter, you can okay. use that. Yes. Yep. Okay, let me see if there's anything else. Why can't we match with the Levo for smaller indoors? Well, I mean, <laughs> you can't do that today. <laughs> so it's not like we're taking away any kind of capability. Mm -hmm. um, and with adding these other capabilities with like Invo and Sapphire, it's about hitting uh, minimum ratings, things like that. So, uh, in our market, the way we go uh, about selling uh, kind of to our, our various customers, most of them seem to be more interested for uh, rebates, tax credits, and, and higher ratings. So we went that direction. Now, if you hooked up a Levo uh, outdoor unit with a <laughs> indoor Slim Duck, would it run? Yeah. Um, but we can't guarantee performance on it, right? Right. Gotcha. So we're making constant improvements to get you the smallest units possible. All right. Okay, so now we're going to, uh, we, we do have more questions to go over. We're going to come back to those after we go through some YouTube comments. Um, but uh, until then, we're going to go ahead and run a... Uh, <clears throat> We're going to run you a short run a short clip uh, to uh, cover our multi pro equipment, and then when we come back, we're going to go over those YouTube comments. Hello, friends. So you love Grease Flex product, but now you want to connect an air handler and some high walls to that same outdoor unit. Grease multi zone systems are great, but sometimes you need more zones and simple piping connections. You want flexibility 
But you can't give up Grease Ultra Heating Performance in those extreme conditions. Grease got you covered. Introducing the Multi Pro and Multi Pro Ultra, your complete single and multi zone comfort solution for residential and commercial applications. For more information, visit greedcomfort.com forward slash multi pro. Multi pro, your complete comfort solution. So we're going to cover these uh, YouTube comments, some selected YouTube comments. As you uh, can possibly understand, we don't always cover every single YouTube comment that's made because you know how YouTube can be. Um, let's uh, let's take a look at, uh, we have a question from um, at Rota Echo on the X-Pac video. It says, I can't seem to locate a technical detail. I live in Phoenix and 115 degrees is very common. I see it has an operating range of up to 125 degrees but what is the inverter protection temperature set to? Well, that's a great question. So uh, one thing I will point out just right off the bat is that if we have an operating range of, uh, of 125 degrees, that the inverter protection is going to be significantly higher than 125 degrees. I mean, we know that uh, from both factory testing, real world examples, and, um, and the technical data itself. Um, so we have, uh, if we do have capacity ratings up to, you know, uh, those limits, then you can rest in, um, you know, uh, I'm sorry, there, there's no reason to worry. Uh, you know, we can operate at those temperatures. If we can produce capacity at those temperatures, that means that our inverter board isn't tripping. It's not, it's not shutting off that it will continue to operate just fine. Um, in fact, you know, some of these boards and some of the board technology that we have is for um, originally for use in, um, in areas that get even hotter than Phoenix, Arizona, <laughs> you know, from a global standpoint. Uh, would you like to add anything, Justin or, or Greg, on that? One thing that I would add is just be careful where that unit's sitting, because if that outdoor temperature sensor is getting beat on by the sun and you get the air code, you may want to. Just make sure, you know, shade that thing from the sun and see if, you know, the temperature is a lot lower with, with it out being in direct sunlight. Right. Well, you know, I saw an article one time, and this is because, you know, the, the Arizona, you know, Mexico, uh, you know, folks, you know, this stuff like this comes up from time to time. And, uh, you know, people will take like an infrared thermometer and point it at the roof and go, hey, it's 190 degrees or whatever up here. Uh, what's interesting is I read an article one time that talked about the uh, temperature difference between the roof itself and six inches above the roof. And there was such a drastic temperature difference between those two temperatures. Like if you were to elevate those, I know you're not worried about snow necessarily, but you can you can help those systems perform a bit better by just getting them off the roof some. Right. Right. Uh, but you know, rest easy because, um, much of the equipment that we carry, uh, you can take a look at the capacity, uh, charts, uh, for cooling on those products. And you can take, you, you can see that we might be able to produce hundred percent capacity, 105, 110, something like that, which is far and away better than what most equipment rated at 95 is going to produce. So you're, you're not going to look at the same level of D rate that you might see in standard equipment for example. Uh, Justin, anything you'd like to add there? Yeah, so I'll say on ductless, uh, the temperature is 58 degrees Celsius or 136 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I don't remember if it's the same on flex or if it's a little higher on flex. I'll look and uh, get back to you. Right, gotcha. So as long as we're maintaining good airflow, our, uh, our heat sink, if it's using a heat sink or in the case of like the multi pro ultra, it's liquid cooled. So that's no longer even a worry. Um, <laughs> as long as that heat sinks nice and clean, you know, it's not, you know, covered up in cotton wood or something like that. You know, you know, you got good airflow, then you should be able to maintain lower than 136 degrees. Um, as those things get hot, it will reduce the uh, capacity to try to keep that temperature low. It's not going to sit there and run and then try to fry itself like you might find and manufacturers who are just recently started making inverter driven equipment, for example. All well, right. That's one thing that I always talk about with Greer equipment. Greer equipment does a great job of protecting itself. It's got right. enough thermistors and, and other sensing devices in it that rather than just shutting down or going out on air code immediately, it's, it's probably reducing capacity or run rate of the unit. They're going to let that machine run until it reaches a, a, a problem that it 
if it if if it was going to stay running, it's going to end up damaging the compressor or something like that on the unit. Right. Therefore, then it's going to shut it down. So, yeah, you can very easily get phone calls from, you know, for service, where the customer is telling you it's just not keeping up, and mm -hmm. it's because that you know there's something wrong with it, but it's not out on their code. Right. So, yeah, and it, it's self protection. So I mean, I, I know that some feedback we've gotten in the past has been, you know, like it's kind of aggravating, right? Uh, but you know, it can be aggravating because you're getting this error code or whatever it is. But it's it's better to get an error code for self protection of some kind, right? Uh, right now than it is to get failure three months from now. Well, the other thing too is it's a <laughs> benefit to the customer too because rather than shutting down and having no cooling or no heating. It's at least giving them some cooling or some heating until the problem gets addressed. As long as it's not damaging the equipment, it probably is not going to produce an air code. It's not going to shut down. Right. All right. So another YouTube comment we have. I'm not going to try to read the username. Um, it was talking about the it's uh, the video for troubleshooting a mist pipe multi zone. This actually comes from what appears to be a homeowner or some type of owner. Uh, basically, you know, they were uh, going through the same thing. The contractor is going to come back, come back out to run these tests that I uh, take it that the homeowner is going to provide the contractor, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but um, but they're asking. But in the meantime, could these tests damage the system? You know, like running one unit, running another unit, you know, that kind of thing. Is that going to damage the system? The answer to that question is no. No. And which because actually relates to... It relates well, the to thing we're talking about with self protection. I mean, that's, yeah, the, the unit's protecting itself. So if it gets bad enough, it's going to shut down an air code. Right. Um, like in that case, if you were running one unit like that and, you know, you got a, a freezing up unit on the other, yeah, I mean, there's definitely some self protections that can kick in. Uh, the next YouTube comment. All right, let's see. Uh, this is on the GRI single zone mini split full installation video. And this says, based on R32, is it allowed? Okay, because I think that's what's being said here. Is it allowed to have the flare connection be inside of room since R32 is slightly uh, flammable? You know, it's an A2O refrigerant, right? The pressure in heating mode can reach 500 PSIG. Y yes, it, it it is allowed to, you know, you can have the flare connection inside. Um, there is a, um, on the R32 equipment, there will be a refrigerant leak detection sensor uh, that helps to, uh, to detect if there is a refrigerant leak. And then we'll bring on the indoor blower motor to help, you know, dissipate or uh, dilute uh, any amount of refrigerant, you know, therefore reducing any, you know, uh, the possibility of any further problems. Um, as far as the pressure and heating mode reaching 500 PSIG, I mean, everything we've got is rated um, at over 600 PSI. Uh, some of our pressure sensors or pressure, excuse me, pressure switches trip at 609 or 619, you know, depending on which product we're talking about. Uh, so we're we're covered, you know, as far as the pressure is concerned. Um, is there anything well, you'd like to add, Joseph? Or, yeah, go ahead. I, I guess the other thing to make simple is, you know, the mini splits, whether it be a ducted unit or it be a wall mount or it be a floor ceiling unit. All of these types of indoor units that we have, they follow the same rules th as far as piping connections go that any other manufacturer of any other air conditioner has to follow. I mean, just because we're using flare fittings, we're still following under the same rules of where connections can be inside the home and so on and so forth. So it's not going to be any different than any other problem. There's not going to be any problem with it because, uh, you know, as James alluded to, pressure switches in, in the system are rated for over 600 PSI. Burst pressure is over 1,000 PSI. Um, you know, as long as you're using good quality copper, <laughs> it doesn't have really thinned out walls, right? It actually follows the standard burst pressures and things like that. Shouldn't have any any, any worries there as long as you're, forming your flares correctly, uh, torquing the flare nuts down correctly as per the specs, you know, following all best practices and everything like that, you're not going to have to worry about any leaks. Um, but if, God forbid, something does happen, there are the uh, leak detection sensors on the indoor units. Uh, so if it gets over 10% concentration, it's going to go off. Uh, the sound the alarm, it'll run the fan. Um, so there's a lot of inherent safety built into these units um, to prevent 
uh, any kind of mishap, right? So as long as the installer is following the best practices, um, shouldn't have any issues with that. More so now than ever before. The best practices become even more of a, of, of a you know, constant, you need to do it. Meaning every single unit you're putting in, you should be following like Justin was saying, making sure that you're making the flare properly. You should be using the flare gauge to make sure your, your fl whatever flaring tool you're using is making the flare correctly. You're using a torque wrench and you're torquing at the specification. But lastly, doing a leak check with nitrogen to make sure it doesn't leak. And then also do it when you do your evacuation, making sure it holds vacuum too. That way, you know, you've got good sound connections that are not going to be a problem because the last thing you want to do with the, the new R32 equipment is, is set off that alarm and have the homeowner calling you. Right. So, the best practices thing is just huge. Yeah, and you got to, you, you, no shortcut. Make sure you're taking the time to make the connection properly and make sure that it doesn't leak before you ever let that refrigerant out into that circuitry. Yeah, I mean, with natural gas appliances, you have connections inside homes <laughs> all the time. You know, pull your, pull your gas stove out, you're probably going to see some yellow flex line going to the back of that, that exactly. stove or even on, uh, your hot water tank, if you have a gas hot water tank, you're going to have a connection inside the home, right? And that's and a whole lot gas more, is far more dangerous a, than R32. As I said, it's a whole lot more flammable than R32. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. How, how much how much gas is available? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got like on on the single zones, you know, less than two, two, you know, two kilograms. But if you're connected to city gas, you've got whatever's in the in the plant's tank, right? Yeah, or the on the planet. I, I don't even know. I don't even know how you go about calculating that. Uh, how much gas can my house hold? I guess that maybe what you know. Um, <laughs> I'd be more concerned with it with it on an LP than I would natural gas, even though you got a limited supply. But it, it's heavier in there. It ain't going anywhere but waiting for ignition. Right. <clears throat> okay, so let's get back to some of the uh, the questions that we had coming in. Uh, Unfortunately, we're going to try to roll through these a little bit quicker so we don't take too much time. Um, all right. Our eight put, our eight part questions coming up, I promise. All right. So um, all, let's see. Let's see. Uh, can you talk about the Envo Fresh Air Intake Kit? It's got interesting applications for light commercial residential. Might have missed it. Came in a little late. Yeah. So the Fresh Air Kit for the Envo is going to mount on the side of the unit and it's going to pull fresh air from from the outside the way it's designed it's it's designed a bit like an hrv in that you're going to have uh some thermal exchange happening as it intakes and exhausts uh the fresh air um so it's it's going to be basically a, a little mini rv hrv that you mount uh, on the side of the unit and by when i say hrv i just mean it's going to be thermal exchange it's not like an erv where you have humidity and things like that. But to help control humidity, that Envo uh, indoor unit's gonna have some smart humidity control built into it. So it's gonna have, uh, uh, it's gonna be a little more cognizant about uh, the humidity inside the space versus uh, our standard ductless units. But uh, we've got um, some information, I believe on the website about the fresh air kit. So if you wanna go on there and take a look at it, you can see it. Um, yeah, that's, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> just just pulls in air and exhausts air. It's it's great. Right. Uh, well, I guess related to the same type of question, uh, let's say an application requires 100% OA or outdoor air ducted split. Do we have a solution for that? Let's say slim duct with Vireo condensing unit. The unit size is approximately two tons or 400 CFM. No. Um, <laughs> as, of, as of right now, uh, we don't have anything uh, on the ductless side. Uh, they can do 100% outside air uh, because you're controlling to a specific set point. And with outside air systems, DOAS, dedicated outside air, you're trying to deliver deliver neutral air to the space. And if I remember correctly, it's something like 74 degrees, 50% humidity. Uh, and then when you're willing dealing with just outside air, you also have to have ancillary equipment to then further deal with the uh, uh, comfort load 
right? Now on the GMV side, we've got some outside air processors uh, that can do a little better at bringing uh, some outside air. But there again, it's those aren't designed for 100% outside air like a DOAS would be. Because uh, again, with the DOAS, you're going to have some additional controls. You're going to have a reheat coil. You've got a lot of uh, additional things in there that makes it uh, a true 100% outside air unit. Uh, so depends right. on your application of what you're you're trying to do, right? <laughs> and how much you're willing to spend. Right. Um, so, yeah, and the smallest uh, capacity-wise uh, fresh air unit that we carry on the uh, on the commercial side is going to be a 42,000 BTU unit. Um, I'm just going to run a number real quick and let you know. Uh, so it is rated for it. Um, so in that case, I believe you'd probably end up using like a four ton outdoor unit. And I know you're looking for two tons, but you know, just some capacity limitations that we've got. So it is an option, you know, using our multi pro equipment, uh, along with the, uh, the 42,000 BTU, you know, fresh air outdoor unit. Um, yeah. now if you're looking for an upgrade from what people do in most new construction where they just tie a, a piece of ductwork and a, and a damper to the outside and just pull in air straight from the outside, uh, then yeah, using a slim duct would probably be a step up from that because you're at least t tempering the air somewhat. Right, yeah, and a lot of these applications, you know, if we, you know, they say, you know, can we bring in more than 10% fresh air, for example? And it's like, yes, of course you can, but I mean, the 10% limit is basically just bringing it into the back of the unit and then just spitting it right back out again. But if you've got an extended return or what would effectively just be a mixing box, right? you can up the amount of air that you've got because you are tempering it before it hits the back of the unit, allowing for some, you know, uh, moisture control. So, you know, in that case, you know, technically it wouldn't be a hundred percent outdoor air unit, but it gives you the CFM that you need for the, you know, the 200 CFM, excuse me. Yeah. The, the 400 oh. CFM that you need. Right. Uh, in addition to providing some more, you know, uh, temperature control. Um, so th there's a handful of different ways to do it. You know, um, you can use, yep, yeah, you can indeed use a four ton outdoor unit on that 42. I know it's larger capacity wise, but it does provide the CFM and the capacity that you need in that application. So there, there are definitely options. Um, okay, I uh, got a question about Atlanta. I'm gonna leave this for Greg. Uh, and I'm in Atlanta. Does Gree have a showroom in Atlanta? Are you, are you familiar with any place that we have something like that, Greg? I don't believe we have a showroom in Atlanta, no. no. But we do have a training lab, do we, we not? We have a training lab. We have a training lab in Atlanta. Uh, so it's definitely something you can take a look at some of the equipment, see how it operates. Uh, that's where we do hold training classes. Um, it's, in fact, it's also where we do our filming uh, for our Tech 90s, correct? And also right. a handful of other videos and that kind of thing. And the next live broadcast will be September 5th. Right. Um, does the Multi 24 have a soft start? Y yes. Yes, it does. Um, not only the multi 24, but every piece of equipment that we've got, it's all soft start. None of it is a hard start type of, we don't, we don't have non inverter driven compressors. All right. Um, and then finally, we have our eight part question and that I'm going to count this as eight questions. So you can't ask any more questions this year. Um, I'm just joking <laughs> uh, on the, uh, on the flex 36. And I guess in this case, it applies to the Flex 60 as well. What is the target high pressure and low pressure and the target superheat and subcooling when checking pressures of the outdoor unit? So we're going to start with that one, Greg. So with that being a fully inverter driven system with no way to lock the compressor speed at specific speed, we cannot give you target subcooling, target superheat target pressures. The refrigerant charge on those is based solely off of weighing the charge in. Right. Okay. I'd like to add something to that. I know that some other inverter manufacturers have given like a chart, you know, like a subcooling chart. But if you look at that subcooling chart, it's like from nine to 19, you know, that kind of thing. Um, if you have a leak, you, you know, you're supposed to fix it anyway, right? Um, it, and the way, you know, I've said it before in the past is that if you, if you know, you had some kind of leak or something, you know, you're low on refrigerant. If you, if you add refrigerant, it is closer to being properly charged than if you didn't. Right. Um, 
but yes, you're absolutely right. There are um, like a dozen or so um, parameters that the unit's using to run at a given speed. You know, trying to grab one parameter and make a determination of whether or not it's running properly is just not what we can do. So the flex in that case is not unlike the mini splits or a VRF product or a uh, multi-pro style system. Well, um, even in the VRF product, just to kind of clarify it a little bit better, you still don't really troubleshoot by pro pressures and subcooling and superheat because there's so many other parameters in that world of equipment that that you got to be able to put it all together at once. Right. You so did. you really can't. If you try to troubleshoot just off of pressures, you're gonna you're not gonna get that machine working properly. Right. And uh, one more thing, um, you know, having the uh, behind the curtain view that I've had in the past, um, the the subcooling or superheat chart or whatever that you're given for an inverter driven piece of equipment, uh, particularly for a rebranded inverter piece of equipment. Uh, the question I would ask, I mean, and I know the answer to this is, was it the factory who provided that data or was it something that somebody saw at one time and then just provide a range, you know? Um, and in that case, most of the time, it's just a range. And if you fall somewhere in that, it could be normal. Who knows? But effectively, what you're doing is if you're if you're looking to try to get a delta or some kind of normal pressure or whatever, it might run great today. It might not run great tomorrow. You know, the sun comes up tomorrow and it's hot. Now it's not going to run right. You know, that kind of thing. So the only way to ensure that it's absolutely going to work like it's supposed to is by weighing it in. Uh, number two is the indoor blower motor constant or fixed torque or let's see i'm sorry is the indoor motor constant fixed torque or variable speed so on the flex. that is a variable speed motor i know currently with the dip switches you'd set a dip switch and it runs at one speed uh but if you look at constant torque or what we generally called x13 motors those were the five speed ecm motors we have more than five speeds on the flex um but currently uh you set it uh, to one speed and, and that's what it runs, but that's, that's really a variable speed motor. Uh, and as I've talked about, uh, I think on the last show, we're working on development of a flex smart controller that will give variable speed capability, you know, basically unlock the features of that motor. Um, but yeah, it's, it's technically a variable speed motor. Right. And if you are uh, looking for a variable speed motor like from us right now in that style of system, uh, I invite you to check out the multi pro. Uh, it does provide variable speed uh, right now. Uh, let's see on the next part of the question is how to test if the blower motor is responding to dip switch changes for airflow. How would you go about testing that? Use a monometer. So First of all, when you set the dip switches on the flex unit, you absolutely have to have the power off. If you change them dip switches while the machine is still powered up, it will not recognize the change to the dip switches until the unit's power cycled. But secondly, if you're trying to just figure out if it is going to be, if, if it's responding, set it at a really low airflow, measure your static pressure, look at the blower chart, see what CFM you're delivering, and then power it back down, set it in a much higher setting, and then reestablish power, turn the fan back on, remeasure your static pressure, and see what your airflow is off of the chart then. That's going to clearly tell you whether or not it is recognizing the speed changes. Because if you go from like speed two setting to say speed seven setting, that's a noticeable difference in the profile we're sending to that motor to make it run it. I have not had any cases yet, and I never say never, where the where a dip switch changed and it wasn't actually being profiled to the motor. Right. That's just not a common problem with it is what I'm getting at. Right. Yeah, there's no reason to try to be playing operation. So yeah, ensure that the power is off when you're making those dip switch changes. But uh, let's see here. Uh, does putting the unit in force cool operation at the outdoor unit ramp the compressor to 100% capacity? It does not. All it does is force it to run. And I, and since it is thermostat driven, if you force it to run, it does not have the ability to turn the indoor fan on. So if you are going to do that, you need to make sure the thermostat, you turn the fan to on and make sure the indoor blowers run when you force it on 
Okay. Does the indoor coil temperature sensor have anything to do with how fast the blower motor runs? I don't believe it does. Um, not through our own testing. No, it, it doesn't. No, do with through it. our own testing, it doesn't. And it doesn't. A lot of people think it, it would add freeze protection. It does not. Um, Which, you know, at that point, what would it do? You know, like what what right. would the air handler be capable of doing at that point? Would it shut the outdoor unit now? You know, it, like it can't, right? I think Gree put them on there as, as a possibility for future production. I don't believe they really do anything at this point. Right. Okay. Uh, let's see. Why does the outdoor unit have a G terminal? It's a test point. So if you actually take that G wire and take it all the way through to the outdoor unit from the indoor unit, if you want to test and see if you're getting 24 volts across that, you don't have to run back inside uh, to check anything. You can just sit, you know, take your meter outside and check all your test points from, from the outside. Hmm. But as far as, as far as functionality, no, it has no use on the, on the outdoor unit. It's just a test point. And if right. that wires ran out there too, that you could always do, if you do have it hooked up, you could you could do the force run operation. You could jump R to G and it'll turn the fan on inside. Right. Yep. Okay. On the I guess particular to the X, the excuse me, the Flex thirty six is the airflow volume at eight hundred thirty cfm or a thousand cfm from the factory at level four default. So on the four ton and the five ton i believe their factory set at speed six not speed four okay and i have to pull up the blower chart too yeah i'm pulling up the blower chart too okay good okay cool so speed six at Depends on the static pressure drop. As to the actual CFM you're moving. All you're yeah. doing is giving it a profile for a fixed speed on the fan. And depending on your static and looking at the blower chart after you measure the static, it'll tell you the CFM that it's actually delivering. Right. Because if you raise or lower the static pressure, it's going to change the amount of CFM that you're delivering. Correct. Higher static, lower CFM, lower static, higher CFM. All you did was give it a fixed speed to run it. And you said you think that is speed six from the factory on the Flex 36? Uh, is that 36? I thought it was five ton or four ton. Oh, no, it's a, it's a 36. Okay, it is speed four. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. So two and three four. ton, it's going to be speed four. And right. four and five ton, it's speed six. So from an AHRI sta testing standpoint, what they've done here is they've got speed four set from the factory. They hook up duct work or whatever apparatus they've got from an AHRI testing standpoint. They hook that up and put 0 .5, 0 0.5 inches of startle, uh, excuse me, 0 0.5 inches of, uh, of um, static that pressure is. on that unit, which would then rate it at 830 CFM. So that is the CFM that it at if you if your duct work is at 0.5, right, and we have it set for speed four, you should be able to expect 830 CFM at that point, right. And if it was at 0.5, you know, then you can you can adjust the static pressure from there to get whatever CFM that you're trying to deliver to the space. Okay. All right. Well, unless you guys have something to add. Um, I think th those are some of the best questions I, I believe we've ever received. And, uh, it's, it feels like they're getting more and more difficult as time's going on, uh, <laughs> which, which we appreciate, you know, we, we do like to nerd out about this stuff. Um, uh, you know, I, I call Greg sometimes, uh, you know, maybe after hours and we're talking about heating and air conditioning and that's just what we do. It's, it's all I ever talk about. Uh, <laughs> All right, so that's all we have for you today. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, one last look. Uh, we already did all that. We don't have any more questions. So, um, well, that's it for Talking Comfort Live this month. We'll see you next time, September 4th. And then on September 5th, we're going to be live from Atlanta. Okay.
we don't normally try to do them back to back like that. It's just with all the other scheduling we had going on, that's the way we had to do it. So right. uh, we will have a live broadcast on from from Atlanta on at the training lab, and it's all going to be about the new product lineup of A2L refrigerants and you know the sensors. What do they do? Where are they located? you know, best practices as far as installation and all that kind of stuff. That's what we're, it's all going to be geared around the R32 free product. All right. Well, I, uh, I appreciate you guys attending. I know it's very hot outside. Everybody's very busy. So I mean, I appreciate the time that you've taken out and, uh, but, uh, until next time, remember agree we're by your side. Hey, thanks for watching talking comfort live with green HVAC. Make sure to keep a lookout for an invite to our next show or subscribe to our Greek Comfort YouTube channel to make sure you get notified anytime we release new content.